third time you've been on the City Forum Speaker Series over oh. two decades, right? Oh, okay. It's kind, of, it's kind of amazing how long the series has been running. But it's a distinct pleasure always to have Susanna back. Thank you. Um, she is a well-recognized both within our region and nationally as an environmental justice leader. Um, she is the uh, founder and director of People Organized in Defense of Earth and Her Resources. Um, she's been at the forefront of some of the most notable and important environmental justice initiatives in the city of Austin's recent history over the last two decades. Uh, she served as a planning commissioner uh, in the city of Austin, and that segues nicely into her topic for today, where she'll be exploring um, land use policy as it relates to the continuation of to argue historic precedents for uh, discriminatory intent or discriminatory impact um, as it relates to urbanization of Austin. So with that, please join me in welcoming Susanna Almanza. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. It's a pleasure. I just want to state that I am a grassroots uh, local community grandmother, mother activist friend. Uh, I'm not a planner in no way, but that doesn't mean we don't know about planning, right? <laughs> but I'm not, you know, a scholar or anything. So I want to start off with this particular one because, you know, I, I had some feedback on about the whole the whole title of using um, racist land use policies and how they impact communities of color. So what we do is we adopted um, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, their net definition of racism and race prejudice plus institutional power equals misuse of institutional and social power, a system of oppression maintained by institutions and cultural norms that exploit, control, and oppress people of color uh, in, or, in order to maintain a position of social and material supremacy and privilege, privilege for white people, particularly the powerful and, and the wealthy and the elite. So uh, most of Austin's gentrification uh, is a consequence of the city's uh, segregation, first to separate but equal policies. Uh, the city plans the 27 Jim Crow uh, laws passed in Texas, the public housing legislation, and the, th and the through disenfranchisement of people, color, voice, and city and state politics, which, you know, you know about the poll tax and so forth. And both the University of Texas and the Austin Independent School District fought against integration. And I think you can see on the left is uh, for whites only sign, and then on the right is, um, is Herman Sweat, who was uh, tried to get into the law school here at the University of Texas and how he had his case had to go all the way to the Supreme Court and all the injustices and the indignities that he suffered along the way. Uh, and then in 1922, uh, Congress then, uh, which is basically a white Congress, uh, passed the Standard State Zoning and Enabling Act. And actually that act was the one that cleared the, the path for further segregation and environmental racism uh, in communities of color. And then we go into 1928, the master plan, because the State Zoning Enabling Act then gave all the cities and the states to begin to plan their cities and to start to segregate the cities. So that's why it doesn't matter where you go, whether it's Chicago, whether it's you know, Texas or Boston, wherever, you'll always find that people of color live on the other side of the tracks, the other side of the railroad, and you'll usually find that communities of color are downstream uh, from where they're at. So what, what that plan said was that they would have a place that would be desirable, and that was basically uh, for whites, and then undesirable, which would basically be for people of color. And, but at that time, they also cited in that plan that it would be unconstitutional for them to use, you know, zoning laws for segregation. So they came up with the idea, well, how do we do it? And so they looked at where at that time blacks were living, and they were living throughout the city. At one time, the city of Austin was pretty well integrated. Uh, but they said, oh, but if you look on the east side by the cemetery, there is an enclave uh, of the black population. So why don't we just start moving all the facilities and you know, churches and schools to East Austin, and that way you began to move it. So it's sort of like zoning without zoning uh, when you look at it, uh, but that is part of the plan, right? 
And, and so you saw like in Wheatsfield, that's really in Travis County where they built the first uh, African-American or the black school. And that's right around the whole, the whole area was pretty much where a lot of this campus is at, right? Further back to the West 25th on. And it wasn't until 1932 that they um, then relocated and built the school on, in Rosewood in East Austin. So you, you began to see how these policies and how they're using these other techniques through deed restriction and so forth to begin to relocate people of color east of Highway 35. And so in that master plan, we, in that master plan we call Yes Master because they told us where we were going to have to live and where we were going to have to bring up our families and, and the schools, right? And along with that, so that's 1928, but in 1990, the city of Austin initiated the smart growth policy and then again made East Austin the, the desired development zone. And so in that in that master plan, it created the first public housing and Rosewood became, the Rosewood course became the public housing for the African American communities. Santa Rita courts became the housing for the Mexican American community. And believe it or not, they didn't like poor whites at the time too. So they, Chalmers was originally built for the poor whites. Of course, now it's, it's all uh, people of color living there, Chalmers. And so the other thing that you, you'll see is the industrial zoning. So when we had the city do uh, the mapping and, and where we were saying, look, all this industry is in our community and most of it is polluting industry and it's industries that are negatively impacting our families. And so you'll see this is purple, but it kind of looks blue, but it's purple. That's all industrial zoning, the yellow single family. And of course the red is commercial zoning. And that's sort of in the Go Valley Johnston uh, Terrace area where Johnston High School is at in Go Valley Park. And Holly, in the Holly Power area from like Cesar Chavez from 35, again, you see all the industrial zoning, purple, red commercial, and yellow, of course, single family. When we looked at this, uh, it actually found that 95% of all the industrial zoning was in East Austin. So 5% was on the west side uh, of the city. And I can tell you the one thing that was zoned industrial was the mall. So if you went shopping at the mall, that was an industrial site, which I went like, mm, I don't know, you could say it's polluting, but in not any way like you would say the Holly Power Plant or the Tank Farm or, you know, Praxair, all these other places. So when you look at the different uh, land uses and ordinance that the city came up with, you'll see that it did, um, you know, 70% of the year single family development occurred in the future urban zones. But also it passed the 1979, they passed the Austin Tomorrow Plan. So when we look at all these different plannings and what's going on during that time, the Save Our Spring Ordinance, which was a really big thing to protect the, the water, right, and protect the environment. But what happened was, again, uh, through zoning and land use planning, it decided that West Austin would be uh, the, the, uh, the drinking water protection zone but East Austin would be the desirable development zone. So you see again here in their planning, they're protecting um, the, the rivers and the streams uh, and they're saying, so now you have to keep, so there's a continuation. The master plan said that all the undesirable things would come our way, right? And yet here in the 90s, they're saying again, you're going to be the desirable development uh, zone. So what does that really mean for East Austin? And then we saw the Smart Growth Initiative uh, along with that. And so we're just looking at that, uh, the uh, drinking water protection zone. So you can see the darker shade, it's all on West Austin. And yet the desirable development zone is like the lighter shade uh, of white. And you can see where that all is, right? So it's really clearly mapped of, of, where, of where the development is going and what they see as the urban core. Uh, the urban core around 35 is that darker shade of uh, gray that you see there. And so then when the city, the city started embarking into the neighborhood plan, so then it said, okay, we're now gonna let, we're gonna break up the city into 52 neighborhood planning areas. And you're gonna get to decide 
what you would like your neighborhood to look like, what it is that you would like to see. And so uh, for years, we're first, you know, for years for, we fought it. We said, oh, wait a minute, we're really concerned about these neighborhood plans and what they, what's going to be the impact uh, on our communities. And so there was a big struggle about uh, the neighborhood plans and how they were designated the neighborhood plans. And that's a really big story that uh, hopefully I'll be able to tell that uh, pretty soon in depth. But uh, what happened was we fought uh, the Cesar Chavez neighborhood plan. We had over 100 uh, people sign a valid petition. They were homeowners against the plan. The city said, well, your valid petition is not going to count because now we're looking at um, an area from 35 to Comal, from 7th Street to the river, and you now have to own 20% of the landmass. And even though you have 100 people, they together don't own 20% of the landmass within that area. So your valid petition is not valid. Uh, our reasoning for fighting the Cesar Chavez plan, because we said, well, you're bringing in a new zoning, commercial service, mixed use. And really, I'm going to tell you that Cesar Chavez, uh, the corridor, was already a mixed use corridor. We had people living. We had the beauty shop, the barber shop. We had the stores. We had the restaurants. So we said, why can't you just change the zoning to match the use instead of doing a blanket zoning? Uh, of what you've done, because we already knew in 1986 uh, the city be prior to that had cumulative zoning. And in the cumulative zoning the city was doing was it had basically zoned so many parts of East Austin industrial, but in the industrial you had single family um, people living, you had homes, people living in the industrial zoning. And then in 1986 they made it restricted zoning, so they basically said, okay, you can no longer build uh, homes in the industrial zoning, uh, you, but you can't put industrial and single family zoning either. But what happened when that happened is that we had a lot of people who were zoned industrial, even though the use was single family. And we learned at that point when there was some federal housing money coming in uh, to rehabilitate the homes, the feds jumped in and said, whoa, Austin, you cannot use that money for those homes. And why not? Well, because they're zoned industrial. This money is for single family zoning, so you cannot use it for industrial zoning. So we knew then that rezoning our properties from anything from the use was going to cause a problem. So we said, okay, renters will, uh, we said renters will be displaced to make room for commercial use of homes. Uh, slide it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now you got it. Thank you so much. So, so what happened was, uh, so when we said, look, the first people who are going to go are the renters because they don't own, and you're going to make more money renting out those homes to commercial uh, than you do residential. The second thing is that the the residents uh, are going to get taxed out because now they're going to be in the commercial zone both versus single family zoning, and that also they wouldn't qualify for federal grants, uh, and they wouldn't qualify for the equity loans, because equity loans had come into Texas, because they were not single family, they were commercial. Uh, and then we said, and there'll be incompatible land uses, they'll, they're going to invade our barrios, they're going to invade our neighborhoods, and then our barrios are going to be gentrified. That's what and we told them. We, and that was one of the reasons we were fighting against the new, um, that time, the new urbanism that was coming into our community, the national smart growth uh, that was moving into all the different cities in the urban core. So we worked on we worked on that we worked on that plan and and we opposed it. Uh, of course, the city went ahead and, and passed it. Uh, it had a small group that was part of that contact team, uh, and a lot of people hadn't been there for generations and did not have loyalty to the community and did not understand of what the consequences, or did not want to understand what the consequences really meant for uh, the residents that had been there for generations. And so right here you have the protest that's, uh, that's happening because we're about to get the first lofts ever under the neighborhood plan. Now condos and lofts would be able to come into our community. And that was the first time ever, and that's right on the corner of Cesar Chavez uh, and Comal Street, 
there they are. It's the Water Street loss, right? There were houses where, where, where we were protesting before the houses had already been uh, torn down. And so now we have the water, the water Street loss that were coming in. And at that time, I'm sure they're a lot higher, but at that time, uh, they were starting at $180,000. And we went like, well, our community lives at 30% median family income. You're going over 100 plus median family income. So how is it that we're going to be able to live there? And they say, well, we won't discriminate. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. Anybody would be able to rent here. And I said, that is not the issue. <laughs> <laughs> the issue is the financing. How will we live there? And now this monster is in our community. Uh, and it's changing the whole landscape and dynamic, right? And so we looked at that part in East Austin from 1990 to 2000, whites had increased 31% and Mexicans 16%. And then, the, but the African American population had decreased uh, by 19%. And so then we saw, we've seen the recent struggle of the John Balloon Piñata store and how uh, the new uh, gentrification and the new urbanism is impacting us even culturally because the piñata signifies a lot of different things for our communities and our families, right? It's a long time tradition uh, that we have of bringing families together, of uh, exchanging sweets with our children uh, and so forth. And now we have the Blue Cat Cafe. So it transitioned from something that was very cultural in our communities to something that was not culturally uh, in our community. Uh, and then you can see here, uh, the, the small house and next to it, it it's not as good, uh, but there's a big house right next to it. Uh, and so it's pretty sandwiched. Next to it is another Mac mansion. Uh, and if you wanna see this one, this is uh, right around uh, uh, Riverview, uh, a street next to Fiesta, Gar uh, Fiesta Gardens. And then we've seen, what we've seen is our houses, the houses where people lived on Cesar Chavez have all transformed into businesses and boutiques and, and so forth. There's a few people that are still holding on to their property, um, but a lot of them is gone. And then so we looked at the whole issue of smart housing and how even smart housing was being used against us and a lot of federal money was being used, but uh, they were starting at 80% median family income. Again, we were zero to 30% uh, median family income. And so again, here was another tool, uh, you know, a planning tool that would come in, but it wasn't for us. And then we saw our laundry mats become like a film school. And so all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're moving in. You don't really need a laundromat because you're not gonna be here. And so most of the people will have their own uh, machines because we're talking about a more professional, higher income group of people moving into our community. And you can see here on Holly, you know, you look at uh, the, you, when you talk about compatibility and so forth and the power, like I said, looking at, looking at power and privilege is that the houses have always got to be looking down on communities of color. Communities of color are all one level, but that shows the power uh, of having this big home. And it's not, you don't have a big home because you have eight or 10 kids like we had when growing up. You have it because it's a sense of privilege, elitist power uh, to have such a big, a big place, you know, to have that room. And then we see what has happened to our communities because the tax shift uh, that is really uh, displacing a lot of our communities. Even though Austin saw like a 9% average increase, East Austin, you can see again here, received a 17 to 18% increase. Uh, so we're really struggling. We're really struggling just to pay our taxes because a lot of the people are on fixed income or low wage earners. And so when you have to shell out three to $6,000 at the end of the year, uh, it makes it very difficult. And then if you don't pay it on time, you get an 8% interest fee and it just goes on and on. And it's just perpetual way of losing your property. And then, so I look at the whole issue of colonialism, the control by one power a department area of people, also a policy advocating based on such control. And that's City Hall, because that's where a lot of the decisions are made. And I should have put a picture here of UT, because they're also in there. But the whole plan was Imagine Austin. Uh, and a lot of people said, 
in our people, in the community of color, they were saying, imagine Austin without people of color. That, that's what that plan stood for. And then the colonization, it's an ongoing process by which a central system of power dominates the surrounding land and its people. And, and that's what's been happening to us is that, you know, money, power, and control have now practically moved us out. Uh, Michael Petrelli had put out a report uh, a few years ago, and zip code 782 is the zip code that I've been showing those land use studies to you, the purple and everything. And zip code 78702 was the second most gentrified zip code in the entire United States an entire United States. So that tells you what is happening. Now, I know that the city didn't like being number two. So uh, <laughs> it got the University of Texas to check Michael Petrelli's report. And they said he made a lot of errors. And he was really number nine. Well, I'm going with Michael Petrelli. He says number two because I see it, I live it, I, I see it every day. So. Uh, to me, it's more real, but still, if you're in the top 10, you're in the top 10. It is just recently one of the most segregated cities in the United States, too. So I don't know if UT is doing that study to see maybe you're not, the, <laughs> maybe you're lower on the list. I don't know. But anyway, so, you know, when I look at that and then when we look at, um, you know, the whole issue of the Native American, because we look at ourselves as indigenous people, and, you know, we look at the Indian Removal Act because the way it was, and we've always said we're on the East Austin Reservation, right? And all of a sudden, the East Austin Reservation has become where everybody wants, where the land is cheaper, where all of these things, where the direction of zoning is happening, and, and, and that land all of a sudden has become gold. And so all of a sudden, it's like, I know we put you there, and we said this would be your home, but... Uh, got to move a little bit further. It's time to relocate you. And you know what the new East Austin boundary is? This is going to be 35 used to be the divide between East and West is Highway 183. So Highway 183 will become the new heading East, the new East Austin, and it will be the new highway that would segregate East from West. And they looked at projections, and you wonder, you know, when we look back in the 1990s and they were projecting for 2005 and showing how the people of color population was moving, we always say, how do they know where we're moving? Well, through land use and planning and through all their ordinances, uh, just like they zoning without zoning, but in this essence they are using zoning, is they figured out a way how to move us further into the next reservation. Um, and so we're now looking at code next. And to us, code next is one of the most scariest things that we're now getting ready to encounter uh, because to us, code next is the final colonization. It's, it is the final step that's going to erase uh, single family housing, affordable housing, and people of color from the urban core. And, and you can only look at the city council agenda and the zoning to see all the different cases that are coming up and how they use it. And, and I, I want to say that real quickly that when we worked on that Cesar Chavez plan and we, where we wanted our stores and where we wanted doctor's office, when we got to the city council, it was a, it was a sentence as to insist that everything was not legally binding. The only legal binding thing was the zoning. That was the only thing that was legally binding. So for years you had planned what you'd like to see in your community and you thought you were going to get funding and you thought you were going to get to change it. But guess what? It wasn't. It was all about rezoning our communities and, and using us. And so that was a real hardship. So right now I want to change real quickly over to the video. Uh, who's assisting me? Live from East Austin, Michael. Charlie, see this house right behind me, the one with the boarded up windows? It's right off of East 2nd Street. The family that used to live here moved out in February, not because they wanted to, but because they could no longer afford to live here.
Moving on up, moving on up, moving on up to my new moving neighborhood. We're none of us not been I said we'd be friends. I said we'd be together, together, you never ever. But now things have changed. I've all rearranged just for the same way. How much I have to walk up to the laundromat. And my neighbors are fat. I'm moving just like that. Cause I'll take out the good and weather and blow up a feather. I'm flocking together. And I'm moving on. I'm writing this song to tell you I'm gone. I'm flocking together. And I'm moving on. I'm writing this song to tell you I'm gone. To my moving new neighborhood, up. moving on up to my moving new neighborhood, up. moving on up to my new neighborhood. Ten years ago, you could buy any house in East Austin for twenty-five thousand dollars. Now, a crunt, the worst lot with nothing to recommend it, no trees in the middle of the block, costs over a hundred thousand dollars. There's lots of sales for three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars for these old houses. That I mean, they're wonderful, they're charming bungalows, but because they were in East Austin, they used to be incredibly cheap. You had a national smart growth movement going on, which the city also bought into, and the whole issue of urbanization against Bra. And what that did was saying, let's bring the people down back into downtown, into their urban core. But what happened was, Austin urban core wasn't empty. It wasn't as if it was vacant. There was communities of color living in the urban core. I don't think it's a conscious, malevolent phenomenon. It's just, it's free markets. And you know, it, the best thing and the worst thing about it are the same thing. And that is, somebody's got a house that somebody else wants, and they pay them so much money that they sell their home. And the, the immediate beneficiary that sells that home of that transaction, who's had this house for six generations, they paid $3,000 for it at the turn of the century or whatever. Now all of a sudden, somebody offers them $350,000 for it. They sell it and they get out, and then they go buy a house in the starter home subdivision, pay $125,000 for it and put a quarter of a million dollars in the bank, they're probably not hurt. I mean, maybe culturally in some way they're hurt, but they've done quite well. But the poor guy next door who doesn't want to go, suddenly he's taxed at a $350,000 value where he used to be taxed at a $25,000 value. They can't afford to keep their home and they're forced to sell it. I grew up over here my whole life. I'm used to this barrio, you know. You know, it's a part of me. But unfortunately, my family had to move because the taxes were over $6,000 in this house. And I think that the taxes are, have been going up steadily like over the past 10 years. One of our young scholars for justice who, who uh, interned with us, uh, actually her family were, was way behind on their taxes and their houses need, needed a lot of repair. And so, um, after being bombarded daily, we'll buy your house, we'll buy your house, they finally got a realtor. Really, they were, they were pretty much, uh, I always feel like people get robbed because they had a very nice piece of property with the house with their grandmother living across the street and everything. And um, they had to end up selling their house. And uh, now there are, currently there are four townhouses where one house was at. I miss my home, you know, I, I do miss it. It's in my heart forever, but we had to move because everything was just getting too expensive. Gentrification, the way Poder defined it, is when people, working class people, are displaced by white upper income people. We don't play around it. A lot of people try to make it, you know, it's not a race issue, it's a class issue, but in this particular community, we don't see ourselves being displaced by higher uh, Latinos or higher professional blacks. We see ourselves being displaced by only whites. What we have found is that there's a lot of young folks that are the classic Austin hipsters that would much rather be somewhere that they consider to be downtown, and they consider this to be downtown. What they can actually afford are starter homes in Cedar Park, Leander, something like that, but they hate the thought of that. They can't stand that. 
They would rather spend the same money, live in East Austin, even if it's on the railroad tracks or across the street from a recycling center, that doesn't bother them. They consider this a very desirable place to be. It's not for the working poor, it's not for families. My buyers are Lyle Lovett's cello player, bicycle motocross champion, um, young artsy people, designers, um, you know, all kinds of, like I say, just the classic Austin slackers and hipsters. Boy, Enrique's neighborhood sure has changed. I'll tell you what, all these artists moved in so fast, and they all look the same, real skinny and walk slowly. The people you are referring to are hipsters. They walk slowly because they got no place to be, man. They're now changing the whole culture in our community because our community has always been a family-based culture. And now what we're seeing is individuals, uh, upper middle class, uh, whites professionals living in our communities. You see signs all over the place when you're driving around here saying yuppies off the east side and things. Um, it's the typical like Soho effect, right? Have you heard of the Soho effect? Which is basically when artists move into, artists move into an area because uh, rent is low. Uh, and Artistic funding in this country, country is abysmal. Um, so really artists are just looking for low rents to be able to continue to do their art. Hola, mi familia. Cervezas, amigo. Yeah, man. <laughs> Look at these guys. Check it out. My boy Chester just produced this. Let me know what you guys think. This music makes me feel weird and depressed. The funny thing that I find are the strange things that people say. Well, we really like your community because it's so open, you don't have fences, and everybody's in the front yard, and there's always music, and it's so colorful and lively. And then they come here and they want to change it all. They began everything that they said they appreciate, they began to de appreciate. They began to say, well, we don't like the way you park, we don't like the way you party, your music's too loud, you know, your, your kids have too much independence. And they start putting up their privacy fences, their big gates that are 12 feet. Everything that they found very attractive in our community, they began to change the landscape of it. And I think that that's a sad part, is because everything that they found attractive, they began to shift and change in themselves. And they looked like they began to build these mini prisons in our community. You have promised us saying that you will provide housing for the people, for the Mexicanos that have suffered like my mother for years and years and years. And now you're coming out there Friday and Saturday to insult us but not writing anything about us, about knowing what this church and the history of this church being this place in the 1920s because of discrimination and injustice. Now, in the 2000th century, you're coming back again to displace the people of color by raising taxes. By these examples, if you go to the tax appraisal district and find out why these taxes are so high and people of low income cannot afford these taxes are being pressured to move out of the neighborhood. Ask yourself, Gus Garcia, are you supporting our neighborhood? Councilman Alvarez? We fought this issue and we're right and you're wrong. You know you're wrong. You haven't provided any, any economic development in our neighborhood. But now you want to push us out. We're tired of your tricks. Is there any council member in here that can step up and say, stop? Stop the insult. Comes out in the newspaper. West meets east. 
I haven't met anybody from West. Let me ask you this. Did the Harris Society forget who was here first? Who was here first? Why is it now Germans, Italians, and Irish? You're wrong. And I'm embarrassed at you, that you cannot provide a leadership to protect my neighborhood and my grandkids. Thank you. To preserve the history, you kind of have to know the history. Um, East Austin, way back in, let's, let's just take it back to the 30s. The Mexicanos that lived here in Austin lived in West Austin, which is now Terrytown. And you have Clarksville, where the, you, know, you have uh, predominantly black families living. And so the gentrification that happened kind of switched everything around. We could talk a lot about why minorities are in East Austin, and it was, it was really uh, a conscious decision on the part of the city planners to make it happen. In 1928, the city of Austin adopted the master plan. And in that master plan, it said that it would start the relocation, basically, of communities of color, because back then, Austin was pretty integrated. We were living on the west side, so were the blacks. So people were living on different sides of the town. But with the master plan, it said we will begin the relocation of people of color east of IH 35. And then all of a sudden, I 35 was like a barrier. And that's, that has, more than anything else, has been what East Austin has fought. You know, everything west of the highway, good. Everything east of the highway, bad. Then they, they also moved the churches. You know, Guadalupe Church was on the west side, and there's an east side. Metropolitan AME Church, which is one block over on East 10th Street, is the church of my family. As a result of the 1928, they had to move the church, which was located where we now know as where the Austin History Center is, and the central library is, it was right in that area, Waterloo, I mean, what's that park right there? I can't remember the name of the park. Uh, and the courthouse. Well, that was where the black AME church was located. And, and because they didn't have any money, but they were under the, under the decree of having to move, they actually tore the church down, cleaned and sa saved as many bricks as they could, and they walked to the present site bringing bricks. And so the men and the children, my aunt was six years old and she was packing bricks from that locale to the current locale. And um, they would spend days and cook, you know, cook food on the site so that the children and the elderly people and the men that were, were, dis were carefully dismantling the church and bring as much as they can back to the original church. So in that in that current church right now, you can see some of the old brick structure. So displacement. I always say we live in the East Austin Reservation. And just like they've always done, that they'd go back to the Native American people and say, well, you know what? We found gold in your land. You're going to have to move a little bit further. We found this mineral. Oh, you got to move just a little bit further. So the same concept they continue to use now that they're beginning to develop downtown. It's like, oh, we need a little bit more downtown. And it just so happens now we're going to cross that highway because you're so close to downtown and we're going to begin to occupy that particular land. Uprooting people, uprooting them from not just their physical space, but uprooting them from their community and those social practices and those beliefs. You can give me a new house, but then you've snatched everything of who I am away from me. And if there's no visual evidence of that, then the next generation is going to be that much more disconnected. So displacement yields disconnectedness. Change doesn't mean displace. Change doesn't mean bulldoze me down so that I never ever exist anymore. Change means you and I coming together and you learning about me and I'm learning about you.
you know, and all the negative involved in that. And there are a lot of ne negative aspects, but all that negative then becomes displaced. We displace the negative. We were forced to live on this particular side of town, but we made it our home. We said, okay, if this is the only part where we can grow our families, and we'll do that. If this is the only place that can happen, and you say we're, we're going to do it. And so we made it, and we made it the beautiful place that it is. Now, you know, we're taking on the biggest challenge of our life, and that is displacement. Absolutely none. And they won't be until you change the legislators. Uh, yeah, you can. A few years ago it was introduced, it never even gets out of committee. I mean, you would have to go to state income tax, and they're not about to, um, to do that. Well, it should be our solution, uh, but I think that there's there's a lot of things we when especially when we're looking at code next. So we need to make sure uh, that single family and affordable housing is that so that when we look at especially like right now they're looking at the bond money for the corridors, but there's no percentage uh, for affordable housing. And then we need to look at all the policies. Like right now. Uh, the incentives is for the density bonus is 10% affordable housing, and then it's usually at 80%. It, it's not made for families. So we need to look at how do we develop housing for families. The other thing is the city owns thousands of uh, public lands that can be easily transformed to affordable housing, whether to give that to nonprofits or do collaboration with nonprofits and private builders. Uh, so those are different things uh, that can be done, whether it's land use zoning, whether it's doing property, where it's affordable housing. And I think the new one is the linkage fee is uh, setting aside for each developer has to pay so much fee and it goes into a fund to develop uh, affordable housing. So I think that we need to do that. We need to uh, build up our educational institutions because that's where a lot of the discrimination has come into is that we have had... Um, lower standards of quality of education, and so it creates this vicious uh, cycle uh, within the community. So I think we need to look at that. We need to make a, the living wage. Uh, if we had a citywide living wage, uh, then you could bring a lot of people out of poverty also. So I think that it's not one thing. It's a lot of things that we have to look at uh, in order to change the dynamics. And one thing is that we have to face the whole issue of racism. And we have to be willing to talk about it, and we have to be willing to undo it. And how do we do those changes? Uh, I, so I think there's not one thing, but there's a lot of things that need to be happening. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about have you seen changes before and after the re restructuring of city council, where now you have geographic representatives? I've been pretty unhappy. We've been pretty unhappy with the city council because when we first in 2015, when we went to them, we have four people of color now on the city council, but yet we haven't seen the progress 
or the organizing and the push to change a, a lot of the stuff. So I think a lot of the what's happening in City Hall is still very much um, structured, institutional uh, racism structured. And if you don't have real strong council members there that are really advocating and say we need to shift to the poor and the working poor, and how do we make sure that we change these policies? Or how do we look at poli policies from an environmental social justice lens when we're doing it? For instance, um, Councilman Karsai was really pushing the secondary um, auxiliary units, right? And we say, wait a minute, that's going to further the gentrification because it takes over $100,000 to build that second unit. And because they were pushing that, like, that's one way for poor people to bring up and get more money. But if you have to spend over $100,000 to build that unit, and then you're going to get an additional property tax, and then you have to have a mortgage of over 1000 So. Uh, where are poor people going to get that kind of money? We've already been redlined by the banks, so more likely we're not going to qualify. But people coming in with wealthy background, they're not going to have any trouble, you know, building the second unit uh, in the properties that they're in. And so we say you got to look at it through the social justice lens. Did you put out funding so that low-income people could build these houses? Is there a low-debt fund available? See, so all of these things, if they're not looking at it, it's not going to happen. Well, and I know they haven't been there very long, but even in this short, short time frame, a lot of policies have moved forward without really venting it from the community. The mobility bond was fast-tracked and never really came to the community to say, how are these things going to benefit the community or not? And so I think that um, the current 10 is still very new, but I also think that they're not very well organized and they're not very much... Uh, talking about and addressing the issue that they could uh, be addressing. Um, so when the developer basically said that, you know, this gentrification issue is, is happening, but, you know, it's just a free market. There's no malevolence about it. I think that, uh, you know, if there's a group of developers that have acknowledged their activities or causing this problem, obviously there is some level of malevolence. So I'm wondering if there's any... Any attempts by grassroots organizations to go after, you know, developers rather than coming out from city policy, you know, lens or direction, if you go to the developers and start to try and talk to them so that they understand a little bit more about the power that they hold to, uh, you know, promote or halt these activities. Mm -hmm. any of that uh, well, we have trying to, you know, as we look at our own zoning cases and, you know, through the contact teams and they come before us, we, we say, well, what's the community benefit from you, from us giving you the zoning change? How is this going to benefit? And I could tell you that one of the cases that, and I don't know if you heard it, but it's the Cactus Rose Mobile Home Park. We're about to displace over 50 families on 500 Bastrop, and they're going to do a high uh, density development with, uh, over 300 market rate units, uh, restaurants, drive through the works, what you see on the corridors, right? And so, uh, actually, we've been talking with the developers, and I think that we've made more leeway, and we're about to, hopefully, in keeping, <laughs> I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to do some new president setting when you displace people about how do you compensate people and and to make sure you keep them within the general area if that's going to happen. So how do you work at that? And so we've been working real closely with the developers to try and reach agreement with community and developers. And I think that it, you're right, that's been a little bit more successful uh, than trying to um, impact policy, but policy is very important also. So you got to have kind of both of those tools. All the way in the back. Yeah, I, um, I was thinking, uh, and I understand the racist history of zoning um, in many American cities, but I was thinking about the no zoning ordinance in Houston and how, you know, it's a really much more racially diverse city than Austin is. So this the side, it seems like the no zoning there leaves the land even more vulnerable to developers because then they can do whatever they want with it. I, I wonder if you could speak to that and or your thoughts about, I mean, it seems like it's a cr criticism of free market capitalism, but how zoning has been appropriated for those purposes. Well, when you talk about Houston, they have wards. So when you look at, uh, at Houston, even though they're able to build, you'll find that it's still very much segregated. 
And so it doesn't matter whether you have no zoning, uh, you still have the same concept of the uh, uh, institutional structural racism that goes on. So you have wards and you have places only where you know, the working poor communities of color can be at. So I haven't seen like, oh, it's such a remark that you have all these uh, mixture because even when they had the affluent African-American community in Houston uh, with Dr. Bob Bullard you know, his wife, they were the ones that said, well, we're pretty upper class African-American, yet we're still getting all this polluting, you know, facilities in our community. And should not we, because we have the wealth, uh, not be having to endure this. So when you look at that, and that's in Houston, and you can go along the ship channel and you can look at where the schools are at, right where all this polluting is in its communities of color. So um, I see that the bigger issue, uh, yes, they use zoning here and in a lot of other cities they use zoning and like Houston is no better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. um, so thank you, I, I appreciate your decolonial anti-racist kind of take on, on something or in particular land use regulations which are seen, I guess, in my interpretation like in the public imaginary, very apolitical, very neutral, uh, technocratic kind of, kind of things that don't really serve to keep these legacies of internal colonialism going. So I, I appreciate that. My question, uh, kind of building from that, has to do more with organizing work. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say, given, given the years of your own activism and, and advocacy work, how do you how have you seen land use regulations, in particular zoning, kind of seeing seeing it as a an effective leverage point for for a political coalition, I guess, of activists and advocates? So, for example, you you might have um, I don't know people who are advocating for environmental sustainability, um, people who are kind of advocating against racism and police brutality and state violence and, and you know, affordable housing and all these kind of constituencies, constituencies coming together, have you seen land use regulations kind of as a point, an effective point to kind of mobilize? Right? A absolutely. Land use has been the land use has been the number one issue that have brought people together because even when we were addressing like the tank farm or the the six polluting uh, oil giants that were in the community, uh, you know, people are looking at it through the health impacts, right? But when we got down to it, it was about zoning. It was about land use. So when you looked at the root of the issue and what was allowing all of this industrialization in our communities, it was it was through land use. And so then people got educated about uh, land use. We actually translated the whole uh, uh, land, the, the zoning codes and everything because you would get it and it was in English and it was very fine point. And so it was translating and giving workshops to people about what it meant when you got those notices. And then forming neighborhood associations so that people could get the notices and know what was coming around their neighborhood. And, and I can tell you that it was uh, uh, are the most powerful thing to happen because you have the Go Valley Johnson Terrace contact team. That's the people who are working on land use zoning and planning. And so they now really understand uh, about planning and zoning. And then you have the Montapas, which is a poverty island, which then got into land use and zoning. And so people have really educated themselves about what is being allowed to come into the community and how it all happens is to land use and planning. And before, you would just think it's something that's happening out of the abstract, but now you know that this is where it's happening. And so we're constantly trying to educate the community about how it works because they see it and they feel it and they know it, but they just don't define it. And I think that that reminds me of some of the things we need to redefine, uh, for instance, sustainability. Sustainability doesn't, through the city, doesn't really look at how do you sustain people who have been here for generations. You know, how do you sustain the people in place and how do you help it? And high density doesn't look at high density in our families, that in most of our families we have, you know, two or three families living in one house. So we're already high density. Maybe not in the definition that they define high density is, but we're definitely high density because uh, most of the people I know, they'll have more than one family living with them. And it's usually, you know, each family has more than one child. And so that's why I said that you have to kind of re-look at how they're using things, how they're using terms, and how those 
and how they redefine the terms and how those terms are negatively impacting us because the high density, the way they're doing about building up does not include families. It includes individuals or two individuals living together. It doesn't necessarily look at family structure at all. Um, thanks so much for coming today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering about, uh, you mentioned that there's a lot of um, city land that could be used to address the affordability yeah. problem. I'm kind of wondering what your take is on uh, community land trusts mm -hmm. and um, you know whether it's better to have those as a solution or work up with other policies that still enable people, uh, low-income people, to build equity in their mm -hmm. property. Right. Right, and I think it's a combination. I think the community land trust is a really good uh, concept, and I'm really sad that the city is way behind on, on moving that forward. It's only been a few properties that have gone under community land trust. Uh, in just recently working on the Cactus Rose Trailer Park, we were saying, couldn't you make the new mobile home park a community land trust, and that way people could live there. They can also transition from mobile home park to manufacturing homes, because then you're building equity either way. And I'll tell you that the city has a big stigma about mobile homes. Uh, it's like to them, like, oh God, you know, that's kind of trailer trash kind of thing, you know? And so the, when, you, when you look at all kinds of housing, you have to be able to say, that's a house. And working on this case, I've learned a lot because the city said, well, we can move people to apartments. And the people say, why would I want to move to an apartment? I have a home. I own a home. This is my dream. Uh, it might not be the dream of $350,000 home, but it's a home. And so why would I want to become a renter all my life when I own a home? And, and stuff like that. So I think that we really need to broaden. That's why I said they need to look at a social justice lens. It's how do we use bond money to make people owners too, whether it's mobile homes, whether it's manufactured homes. How do we transition people out instead of just going through apartments? And why can't apartments become, they become owners of those apartments? There are cities where you become owners. Why aren't we heading into that asset building, that equity building? that kind of thing. And I think this, the city is way behind in its curb of how it views things and, and trying to bring changes, like I said, to the city. Just last week, they passed a resolution to look at three properties and to select a project to do a multifamily uh, housing. Two years ago, they passed that same resolution. Look at three properties, make it a project. So I, go, so I said, hey, are you coming back two more years and with the same resolution? Because I was here two years ago, I have a copy here where you said you were going to do these properties and nothing happened. And now you just changed the dates and the names and you're doing the same thing. So that's why I said that I'm really like this city. It, I mean, it, it makes me angry and, and it makes me mad. It makes me sad. I go through all these emotions with the city because uh, they don't understand living in poverty and they don't understand or they don't want to understand that there's people that are working two or three jobs, but they're not making the money where they can uh, they can move to another house or so forth. And aren't we supposed to look at the most vulnerable population, whether it's through a human being or whether you're a religious person, is who do you look after? And I think that the city is not doing that very well at all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one last question. Or... <laughs> So you talked a little bit about working with developers and things like that. I was wondering um, how you feel about like projects that have happened already or in the works that have tried to do that, whether they fully succeeded or not, like um, the Chestnut development that's over near the rail station and then like Think East, which is in the works now. Mm -hmm. Well, we've actually uh, worked on the Think East project, and that's how we were able to negotiate some affordable housing into it. And I think that that's what we need more of, is that we need to sit down with developers and say, okay, you want this, but you also have to bring a balance. How much of this land will you be willing to do for affordable housing? And the only reason we got that was because when Mike Martinez was a councilman, when he did the new PUD ordinance, he made sure that if you were going to go to a PUD, that you had to include some affordability. Had he not put that into an ordinance uh, on the new PUD ordinance, we wouldn't have been able to at least negotiate it. And that's why I say you've got to have both. Because if you have council people that are really looking through it through another social justice lens and say, wait a minute, if you're going to want all these benefits, how are you going to benefit the other side of the community? And, and that's why we were able to negotiate 
with the developers and getting uh, some affordable housing. I think we're going to get about a total of about maybe 300 units that are going to be affordable in, in that project. How do we define affordable? And yes, and then, then there's the audition because what's affordable for one is not might be affordable for other ones. So that we usually use for a low income working class minimum wage is zero to thirty percent median family income. A family of four, I think that's like twenty eight thousand dollars. That's the affordability. And then you go to fifty percent. I think it's fifty four thousand. So uh, using uh, the HUD definition of median family uh, income and what that is. Okay, well, we've come to the end of the, our scheduled time for the classes. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.